Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to um, Matthew 1, um, verse 18 to 24. <clears throat> so this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to make, take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we explore your word this morning, we pray that you open our eyes to see you. Um, you open our ears so that we'll hear you. Um, speak in me, speak through me, speak in spite of me. And may we encounter you this morning and be forever changed. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So every year, whenever it comes to Christmas, I'm, almost, I'm always struck by the fact of how pleasant everything seems this time of year. Now don't get me wrong, I know it's not an easy season for a lot of us. I, we all know the stats of depression shooting through the roof, of our stress levels rising up. But it seems that collectively we've all decided um, we're going to do whatever we can to make this as pleasant as possible a season. You know, It's a season of giving. Um, Nonprofits and charities depend on this time of year because this is when they make this is when they make their budgets for the next year because everybody is in such a generous spirit because after all it's Christmas. Um, we do whatever we can to show our generosity, to show our kindness to our brothers and sisters. It's the season of it's a wonderful life of the miracle on 34th Street. It's the season when we cheer Tiny Tim and his wonderful spirit and sneer at Ebenezer Scrooge, even though if we're honest, we're much more like Scrooge than we are like Tiny Tim. <laughs> you can find this pleasantness in our Christmas music, you know, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. In the meadow we can build a snowman. How, how pleasant. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's a time of children laughing, people passing beating smile after smile up because on every street corner you hear yeah. silver. <laughs> but before you think it's a problem just, you know, with the secular Christmas industry, I think, you know, in church we are sometimes guilty of that same wonderful pleasantness. Here in the songs that we sing, you know, we sing of angels on high singing sweetly over the plains. We sing of the little baby Jesus asleep on the hay. It's so cute, you can put it on a Hallmark card. You know, churches all over, not ours, but probably soon, will be lining up their nativity plays soon, where parents will clamor over to the front of sanctuaries to take pictures of their little one dressed as Mary or Joseph or a wise man or more likely the Christmas donkey. You know? <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I love that part of Christmas. Right after this sermon, I'm going up to Leavenworth for you know a couple just a couple of days to relax you know, I love that part of Christmas but I wonder and I've been wondering as I've been looking at scripture this week with that pleasantness have we sanitized and domesticated the first Christmas of long long ago because I realized that when God came to be born as a little babe in a manger it wasn't all sweet and nice and cute and pleasant, but it was the rudest 
most scandalous interruption God has ever made in our lives. When he came down, he shattered the comfortable lives we were living in because he didn't come to be just a cute baby in a manger. He came to make all things new. It was a scandalous disruption on all of our lives. And as most of these scandals begin, it began at home with Joseph and Mary. When Joseph finds out Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now to give you some background, you know, um, marriage back then is kind of, was a whole lot more complicated, a more elaborate process than it is right now. Um, it all started with, you know, an engagement, which isn't the engagements of nowadays where we go on a pier and pop a ring and ask a question and that's that. No, this engagement meant two families coming together, sitting at a table and deciding, is this match going to be good for us, going to be good for the family? Is it going to bring prosperity? Is it going to be, yeah, is it going to be good? So that's the engagement process. And then there's what we call the betrothal process, um, which is usually a period of about a year in which the family has time to let everybody know that this bride and this groom, they're meant for each other. No one else can make a claim on them. They are separated for marriage, but they're not really married yet. And then we get the actual marriage. So when we read this passage today, they're not actually married yet. They're in this betrothal phase. And everything's going along fine. The families have already come together. They've decided this is a good match. Um, and suddenly a wrench gets thrown into the works. Mary was pregnant out of wedlock. And you know, we as a society have gotten much better, I would say, at not stigmatizing unwed mothers. We're not there yet to a point where we're really good at it, but we're getting better. But back then, this was pure and utter scandal waiting to erupt. And there were only really two options to figure out what had happened to Mary. Either Joseph had gotten her pregnant, or someone else had. Because let me tell you, the excuse of the baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit is just about the lamest, worst excuse you could come up with in the history of bad excuses. You'd almost have to hope it was true, because you know, otherwise Mary is just a really, really bad liar. And as far as Joseph knew, he knew he wasn't the father. All he could go on was the child was not his. And he knew he had very few options available. The Bible says that he was a lawful man, which I believe meant that he sincerely wanted to do the right thing in this situation. He was a God-fearing man. He obeyed the law. He was an upright citizen in society. And so when he was faced with this situation, this horrible scandal about to erupt, about to bring shame on everyone around him. He tried his best to fix it, and he only had three alternatives, really. Number one, the first alternative was, well, we can carry on with this marriage, you know, and I will willingly marry an adulterous woman with a child that's not my own. And because this is a small community, Word will get out that the child is not my own and there will be shame on my family, scandal on my family for all times and all eternity. Or, as the law would require, I could divorce Mary publicly, save myself in the process from the shame and the scandal and keep all of it upon Mary. Or, I could be the really nice guy and divorce her quietly so that presumably she can shotgun wedding with the real father. Those are the options. And if he did that option, divorce privately, all shame would be averted and their lives would not be ruined. Because like I said, this is a, <laughs> back then people lived in small communities, small close-knit communities. 
without TV, without internet, without sports, without shopping really to distract them with. The only currency of entertainment that they had was town gossip. If the pregnancy became public knowledge, you can be rest assured that it would follow Mary and Joseph for the rest of their life. There would be no such thing. We, they would not have the luxury that we have of being able to reinvent ourselves in a new place. This stigma would carry with them for the rest of their life. This scandal would carry with them for the rest of their life. So Joseph decided what he thought was the most reasonable approach. If I divorce her quietly, at least as a chance, she won't be disgraced. But God has other ideas. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. And he tells Joseph, no, 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 no. You might think your idea is a great idea, but abandon that plan. Because the truth is that audacious excuse Mary has been giving to you it's true. The audacious thing is this child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit and more importantly you're going to call him Jesus and he will save the world from its sins. And rather than hide from any potential scandal you're going to incur, the angel of the Lord asked Joseph, you're going to invite the scandal and you're going to bring the shame upon you because you are going to proclaim this truth. The virgin is your child and he is going to be called Emmanuel. Your family is going to be ridiculed. You'll be forever mocked for your decision to continue with this marriage. People, because it's a stupid excuse, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. People are always going to think Mary was unfaithful and that you're a fool for believing a preposterous lie. But here's the thing, we have our Christmas story today because Joseph invited the scandal. Our salvation does not come unless Joseph invites the scandal. Our hope that we celebrate our Christmas does not happen unless Joseph embraces the shame and the ridicule. And in some sense, I think we're called today to carry on that tradition were to carry on the tradition of embracing the scandal and shame of telling the world the audacious truth that we believe that Mary was not knocked up by some random Israelite, but we believe she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. We believe that the child born was not just some random child, but is the Son of God come down to save us. So the story of Christmas is a scandal. And it's when we believe that the son that Mary bore the Son of God that it becomes a scandal not just for Joseph and his family and for the shame and ridicule they feel, but it becomes a scandal to the world. Because let me tell you, as long as Jesus remains a cute and cuddly baby in a manger, the world is fine with letting us have that. That's harmless, that's toothless. As long as Jesus is a cute image, it's a nice, harmless, quaint thing for Christians to believe, but it has no impact on the world. But we believe that this child is the Son of God, who would come down and deliver us from the power of sin and death and free us to be his own. We believe that this child would grow up. He would make all things new. We believe that when this child grows up, he will take upon himself all the sins of the world die upon the cross and rise again. He is Savior. And the problem, and when it becomes a scandal for the world is because if we truly believe that He is the Son of God, then everything changes. If He is the Son of God, then He threatens to change our world that we've become very comfortable with. And I think when Jesus went about his ministry, that's exactly what the Pharisees knew would happen. I don't think the Pharisees didn't believe in God. I really don't. I think sometimes we paint them as villain, as like caricatured villains of people who just didn't believe in God and were trying everything to stop 
Jesus from ministry. I think they were good people. They believed in God. They obeyed his word. They sought to pass on their faith. Um, but they knew that if they would accept, if they had to accept Jesus, not just as a nice, as a good teacher, not just as um, an anointed prophet, but as son of God, then everything would have to change. The scandal for the Pharisees was not that um, the child was potentially born out of wedlock. The scandal for the Pharisees is not that potentially he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The scandal for the Pharisees is that we had the audacity to claim that a child could be the son of God. Because you see, nothing they had ever thought of had made them anticipate that that could be possible. The scandal of Christmas is that God did something that none of us expected him to do. He decided to come down. The Pharisees were saying, oh, why would God become one of us? Because that's an absurd and stupid thought. Because we believe in an almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth, for whom we are simply specks of sand. We believe that he has created every creature here on earth. He has the power to shape the mountains that are around us. We believe in a God who is holy, true, and just. And we believe in a God who is so much greater than ourselves. And we have the audacity to believe that he would want to become one of us. That he would want to step into our world, defile himself by entering our world of sin. That he would breathe our filthy air, drink our tainted water. He would choose to feel hungry, to feel tired, to feel all the pain that happens with human existence. So the Pharisees objected to Jesus from a theological standpoint. Why would God do that? That doesn't make any sense. God is high and mighty. But I think they also did that because they realized that if that were true, if God really did come down, then everything that we have built our world to be needs to change. In Philippians 2, Paul reminds us of the implications of God coming down. He said that Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, and even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him in the highest place, gave him the name above every name. But Paul says, right at the beginning of this, what the Pharisees feared would be true if Jesus did come down. He said, if it's true that God came down, did not consider equality with God as something between grass, we have to have that same mindset as Christ Jesus. Here is why it's a scandal to the world. If God, who is high and lifted up, decided to come down and live amongst us and breathe out filthy air, a holy God could choose to be born in a dirty stable. If the one true Lord of the universe could let go of his position, lower himself to the point where he washes the feet of his uneducated, young, simple-minded disciples. What does that say to us? Because we live in a world in which we love to rank and we love to place others above another. We like to think that our education, our wealth, our social status merits people treating us better. We're a society that's built on honoring celebrity, celebrating first class for treating each other differently based on whatever petty differences we can come up with. You see, if God just remained on high, as the Pharisees wanted, if God remained high on the pedestal, then we would be allowed to think that. We would be allowed to think that just as God is high on a pedestal, we too can rank ourselves relatively high on that pedestal. We're allowed to treat each other differently. But if God is both on high, and at our feet. If God becomes one of us, dies for us, saves us, then suddenly we have no more right to do that. And that's going to, sh that's going to change the world and shake it up in ways that we, can, we can't even imagine.
because we'd have no more right to pull a rank, to lord our wealth, our knowledge, and our expertise over anyone. We'd have to become like Christ. We'd have to humble ourselves. And who would want to do that? And that's why I think we celebrate Christmas every year, because we need to be reminded that when Christ came, He came to do, He came to make everything new. He came to shatter our box of expectations. He came to lower the mountains to raise up the valleys. He came to make everything new. And that's why it will be a scandal for the world. And it also will be a scandal for us. Because I don't know about you, but I think, especially in the church, we don't like new. The phrase that gets thrown around time and time again in church, not this church, of course, but, you know, the phrase that gets thrown around is, that's not the way we do things. We have our traditions, we have our practices, we have our music style, we have our ministries, and we'll do our level best to object to anything that might jeopardize that. If you read the history of the church, it's a history of people resistant to change, hesitant to the new, suspicious of anything that is different, staunch defenders of tradition. And you know, we can't blame ourselves too much. Our human father, Peter, was much the same. If you read the story in Acts, when he's praying on a roof and a sheet comes down, and God help with a bunch of animals that are unclean for him to eat. And God says, take one of these and eat. When God tells him to do something new, Peter says no. And the thing that we often gloss over is that Peter never eats any of the animals. He's given this opportunity three times, and he resists three times because we are afraid of the new. But that is exactly what Christ came to do. He came to make all things new. And that's what we should be reminded of each Christmas. He's come to make all things new. But I think the problem is more than any other season I can think of. Christmas is not a time when we want to do things new. Christmas is a time when we try and repeat things we've done in the past. So perhaps you've been celebrating Christmas wrong all these years you know we've built up all these traditions and things that need to happen and i'm i'm the same way my christmas tradition is that after the christmas eve service and i've sent all of you away i go back home and i need to watch it's a wonderful life <laughs> <laughs> and i need to watch the alistair sim version of a christmas carol that hopefully takes me into the morning and that's when we open presents and if i don't get to do that i feel like christmas didn't happen <laughs> We all have our favorite dishes and, you know, God protect the one who forgets to put our Christmas, favorite Christmas dish on the menu that day. <laughs> Everyone has their favorite Christmas carol, and I'm going to apologize in advance if it doesn't get sung on Christmas Eve this year, because then we'll be, then we'll be there till 12. In church, we have our Advent wreaths, we have our Christmas trees, we fill our schedules with program upon program that needs to be repeated year after year. We have our regular rituals of shopping, we have our strategies, we have our are you an open present you do you open presents Christmas Day or Christmas Eve? Because those are two different kinds of people and you don't want to hang out with the wrong kind. <laughs> <laughs> do you wrap your presents or do you put them in a gift bag? It's not Christmas unless our rituals happen. And then you wonder why we get depressed every year. Maybe it's because we're celebrating the old and have stopped looking for the one who makes all things new. Maybe it's because we keep chasing the Christmas of our childhoods and we miss, we miss Christ standing right in front of us. We're so busy chasing after the rituals that we've forgotten the one who came to save us. The scandal of Christmas is that God hasn't come as a sweet and cuddly baby for us to fawn over. But he's come to save us, to call us out of our rituals and call us out of our malaise and our depression and our loneliness and our despair. He's come to mess us up in the big and small things of our lives. He's come, come to call us to witness something new. 
So perhaps this Christmas season, I don't know what God's calling each and every one of you to do. Perhaps he's calling us in the busyness of our rituals to maybe stop, find him again, and see what happens. Perhaps he's asking us to hand over the old ways, our old sins, our old habits, the things that we've hold, held on to for so long, and allow him to make it new. Perhaps he's asking us to release the bitterness of Christmases unfulfilled that we stored up for ourselves and give it to him so he can heal us. Again, I don't know what it is for you because I know in each of our hearts there are places where we've allowed to get hard, places we've allowed to become set in our ways, places we refuse to let God in, where we've become content and satisfied. And the question this Advent season is, will we allow God to rudely and scandalously interrupt us again? Are we willing to see him this season not just as sweet little babe, but as our Savior, our Lord, our friend? Are we willing to let him make all things new? Will you pray with me? Father, we confess that it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to lose sight of why we celebrate the season at all. And first of all, we just thank you that you decided to come, that you decided not to stay up high, but to dwell among us, to live with us, to hurt with us, and to love us. We thank you that you came to make all things new. And we pray that these next few weeks as we continue to prepare for Christmas, that you will meet us in a fresh and new way. That you will show up anew in our hearts. And that we will see you and glorify you for it. We pray and ask this in your, your name. Amen.